The goal of this lesson will be to learn how we can manipulate UV values to result in our sampled texture being rotated around the pivot point. So the first thing I'll say is that I could just tell you the formula for rotating a 2D point around another point. And you could plug in the numbers and get the right result and we could move on. But this is a good opportunity to peek at the way the maths are put together. I like to show ideas geometrically by seeing what the maths are doing visually at each step versus running through a whole series of equations and only dealing with the abstract mechanical processes. We are defining a 2D point which is anywhere on the XY plane. This is the same as the UVs, just with different names for the two components. We want to be able to take any point with arbitrary coordinates and rotate them around another point at an angle that we specify. This will have the effect of our texture being sampled at a different point and look as if the texture has been rotated. This operation will take as input a 2D point that we want transformed, a 2D point that is our pivot that we want to rotate around, and lastly, an angle that is the angle we want to rotate the point by. The output will be the location of the rotated point. To understand how to do this, we need to explore some fundamental theory on the trigonometric functions sine and cosine. The fact that sine and cosine are both functions means that they take an input and map that input to an output value. First, let's understand a bit about the nature of the sine and cosine functions. Let's just graph the functions themselves. You can see that we have the x-axis that represents the input values, which is the angle of rotation, and the output of the function is plotted as the y value. You're probably familiar with these functions and the way they look with their characteristic wave-like appearance. But this doesn't actually tell us much about the generation of these functions or where they come from. They don't just appear out of thin air in the universe and arise out of nothing. One of the important things to realize about sine and cosine is that they are the names given to represent something that we as humans have defined ourselves. One of the definitions of sine and cosine is that they are the ratios between the lengths of sides in a right angled triangle. We're not going to dwell on these definitions in this course as it's not very useful for visualizing rotations, but it's good to know about their existence. The other definition of sine and cosine is that they represent the x and y coordinates of points on a unit circle at a given angle. A unit circle is a circle of radius 1. This means that all points on the surface of this circle are of length 1 units away from the origin. For sine, here's our definition. If we input a value which represents an angle around the unit circle, which we'll call theta by convention, then the output of sine will be the y coordinate of the point at that angle. For cosine, the definition is that if we have an angle theta, then the output is the x coordinate of the point at that angle. Again, this is just something that we are saying is true because we've defined it that way. It's not something that is inherent in the properties of a circle. One memory mnemonic I used to remember this is to ask myself the question, why sine because of x? It's also worth pointing out that the units of the angle we're using here as input is measured in radians, and the range is 0 to 2 times pi. A radian is defined as the angle we get when we wrap the radius of the circle, which is 1 in the case of a unit circle, around the edge of the circle. The angle that is made from the two ends of that arc is 1 radian. It just so happens that there are 2 times pi radians that make up a complete circle. So if you're used to thinking about the angles of a circle adding up to 360 degrees, then saying 2 times pi radians is exactly the same, it's just different units. So you can also say that the angle that makes up half a circle is pi radians, and a quarter of a circle is pi over 2 radians, and so on. So we can make a point that is made up of the definitions for sine and cosine for its x and y coordinates. We can write this as cosine theta for the x coordinate, and sine theta for the y coordinate. We see that we get a point that rotates around the origin counterclockwise, and it's counterclockwise because that's just the way that we've defined the angle in relation to the positive x-axis. This works for any point that begins on the x-axis. The range here of the angle is 0 to 2 times pi, and we're starting to see the beginning of the rotation formula that we will end up on that will work for any point, not just those that start on the x-axis. So to break this down a bit, we can graph a point that is cosine theta 0, which is just the x-coordinate, and we can see that it just oscillates back and forth. Also, the point 0 sine theta is the y-coordinate of the rotating point. These are just the separate components projected onto their axes. 
it's easier to see when we show both lines to show them intersecting at the rotating point. There's a kind of inverse relationship between sine and cosine. When we flip the x and y coordinates, we are effectively mirroring the direction the path is taking, with it starting up on the y-axis and going clockwise around the origin. We can also see that by multiplying the cosine and sine by a constant value, then that is effectively giving the coordinates of a point on a circle that has a smaller radius. We can say that the 2D location of a point around a circle has the generic function r times cosine theta, r times sine theta, where r is the radius of the circle that the point takes a path around. If we plot the path of this point, point 0.6 cosine theta, point 0.6 sine theta, then it's clear that we are defining the position of a point on a smaller radius. A problem arises though when we have a point that does not start sitting on the x-axis. So far, this form of the 2D point only works if we start the point on the x-axis. So let's plot a point, point 0.8, point 0.2, and use that as our value that we want to rotate. So how do we get this new point to rotate? The trick is that the point is always the result of going along one direction by a distance of point 0.8 along the x-axis, and then travelling in another direction on y by a distance of point 0.2. And this is true no matter the angle specified. And it's also true of any point anywhere on the 2D plane. You can go along the x-axis by any amount, positive or negative, and the same in y to get to any point you want. These two offsets can now be rotated together. When we increase the angle, the two offsets combine to give us our new rotated point. So let's break this down into its components. For the first offset, we're going to visualize the rotation of a point whose path rotates in a circle around the origin at a distance of point 8. This is going to give us the first offset in x. This point is given by the coordinates 0.8 times cosine theta and 0.8 sine theta. The second offset is always going to be a distance of 0.2 from the end of that first offset. The key thing here is that the angle between these two offsets is always a right angle. And this angle holds even as we rotate around the origin, which means that the angle for the second offset always increases with the same rotation, just 90 degrees more. And that means that the second offset is also given by a point that rotates in a circle, but instead of rotating around the origin, it rotates around the end point of the first offset. If we visualize a circle at that point, we can see that the desired point rotates in a circle relatively to the first offset point, and we know that the radius is 0 0.2. So we need a method to make a point that rotates with a specific radius, or well, we can just use the generic formula we just looked at, except this time we need the rotation to start on the y-axis. So let's define the rotating point with the standard sine and cosine coordinates with a smaller radius, which is 0.2 times cosine theta and 0.2 times sine theta. And we need the rotation to start from the y-axis. We saw that before when we swapped the x and y coordinates to mirror the path the point takes around. So we swapped the coordinates, and now the point starts in the right place to give us our offset. The last thing we need is to make this point rotate in the opposite direction. To make it go counterclockwise, we simply need to multiply the x-coordinate by negative 1. So now, just by following our vector addition rules, we can add these two vectors together to stick the smaller one onto the end of the larger one, and we end up in the right spot. So we plug it in and get a final solution of our x-coordinate being given by 0.8 times cosine theta minus 0.2 times sine theta, and our y-coordinate being given by 0.8 sine theta plus 0.2 times cosine theta. I can now tell you that that is indeed the formula for any 2D point being rotated around the origin, where the new rotated x-coordinate is given by the original x-coordinate times cosine theta minus the original y-coordinate times sine theta, and the new rotated y-coordinate is given by the original x-coordinate times sine theta plus the original y-coordinate times cosine theta. This could have been derived by using algebra and trigonometric identities, but I personally prefer seeing the maths at work and piecing things together from their parts. Also, hopefully, it was useful for you to see a glimpse of another geometric way of looking at the trigonometric functions other than just memorizing the equations of the right angled triangle approach. So, we've discovered how to rotate around the origin, but now we need a way to rotate around an arbitrary point. This is actually quite simple, and we've seen this before, 
we can subtract the desired pivot point from our original point, which effectively transforms it to be centered around the origin, and then perform the rotation as usual. Then after it has been transformed, we transform it back to its original position by adding the pivot point. So that covers the basic theory of 2D rotation. Now let's go and see how we can implement this in the engine.